You know, recently James Gunn mentioned that he feels like movies are getting worse. And I agree with him. I do. I do. I think it's pretty apparent that movies are getting worse on many levels, right? There's the big budget thing, which is what he's talking about. Um, But then there's also independent film. And I want to dive mainly into independent film, but I'll just briefly touch on the big budget thing. Briefly, because I've never made one of those movies. He's better to speak on it than I am. But as an outsider and a filmmaker and a film lover, you know, yes, it's one there's just, it's regurgitating the same old stuff again and again. I mean, they're so stuck in these formulas that they try to use. No one wants that. I mean, you got to be so mindless to want it again and again and again and again. I think it's just, oh, who wants that? And that's bad. It makes a bad movie, right? Like whenever they let someone get a little crazy, like Matt Reeves on the new Batman and really do something that's got, you know, filmmakers touch or even what they did with Logan, like the kind of like the Western style, um, you know, superhero film, like those are cool. Right. And not to say that the big Avengers stuff isn't cool. The get go is real cool. Right. Cause it was fresh then, but when these things fall into formulas, um, there's problems. Um, but again, I don't want to get too much into the superhero thing and the big box office thing, which by the way, like the big box office thing really is only just the superhero. I mean, it's the only game in town as far as big box office goes. I mean, even your latest big action style movie like The Gray Man is a Netflix movie. You know, like who else is taking big chances, especially on original IP? It's just not happening. So that's another problem with the big movies. There's, it just, there's just no original risk taking anymore. Uh, originality has been sucked out of the system entirely. It has to be based off of pre-existing IP remake of a movie or a comic or something. And that's cool, but not when it's the only thing, you know, um, I digress. Let's talk about independent films. Cause that's something that I know a little bit more about independent films as well have suffered significantly. Now there are still good independent films being made. No question. There are even companies that do them. A24 is a great example. Love that company. Love what they're doing. Um, it's interesting, though. They almost have a stronger style now than their filmmakers do, right? Like, you could, like, spot an A24 film in many ways. It's almost like there's this – they have their own formula. Not entirely, though. Big fan. Um, but there's a whole slew of movie that gets made that is just absolutely terrible. And you can go and – check out a YouTube trailer channel and just see, you know, every day, every other day, some new movies being dropped with great actors, right. With real legends, you know, like with, I hate to name names, but they make the movies. People like Morgan Freeman, John Travolta, you know, Bruce Willis, Mel Gibson. Um, There's so many, there are so many of these usual stuff. Antonio Banderas, great actor. So many, they do these garbage movies. You look at the trailer and you're like, Oh my God, it's terrible. You know, like you can just see it. You can see it in the trailer. I don't know who watches this stuff. And then God forbid you watch the movie. Well, you're really going to see that it's just trash. And here's why. There's a very good reason for why so much shit is being made. And it doesn't have to be like this, by the way, at all. And we'll get into it. So let's go back. The 90s, right? An amazing era in film. The 90s, I'll just start there. Obviously, there's so many great eras from the 40s onward, you know, from noir to the musical of the 50s to the counterculture film of the 60s. And I'm just being super broad here to just amazing independent cinema of the 70s. Everyone loves the 70s, right? Then, of course, the blockbuster comes out of the 80s and this feel good thing that happened in the 80s. And then, like, kind of back to you had one cool action movies like the diehards and like this whole suit, you know, like, you know, you had your Willis and Stallone and Schwarzenegger action era. But at the same time, you had all this wonderful crime cinema being made. You had, you know, Scorsese starting off the 90s with a bang with uh, Goodfellas, Tarantino coming out, Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, David Fincher, Michael Mann. I mean, there's just so much cool stuff happening in the 90s. It was all very original, mind you. These were not based off of books, a lot of them. They were not based off of IP or they were not remakes of old films. For the most part, it was original storytelling. And this was enabled in large part by the DVD. The DVD 
was amazing, right? Because, you know, how could you pirate a movie in the 90s? The, really, the only way you could pirate a movie back then was like you go to the movie theater and then you go watch another movie after the one that you paid for. You know, how many times can you do that in a day? Once, maybe if you're a true fiend, you do like two or three, you're right, spend a day in the movie theater hopping around. How many people are doing that? It wasn't a ton. It wasn't really killing profits, right? So people were seeing films in theaters, one, they weren't stuck on their phones too, right? So there wasn't this competition, but then they had the DVD. The DVD generated tons of money, right? And that money allowed studios and smaller studios to really take risks, and make a movie as an example, Seven, right? Seven is a detective story, okay? And today, you want to make a movie like Seven, a studio is not going to do it, right? Some big studio is not going to do that movie. So you got to do it for a smaller budget. You know, Back then, it has Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman, $50 million, and they're able to really go far with the look and put rain in every scene and make it a big film and get you know, a hundred days to film it or whatever and do a lot. Now you, you want to do that movie. You're going to go to some smaller company. They're going to say, okay, we'll do it for $7 million, but you need to have Bruce Willis in 80% of it or someone like him, right? We could sell Bruce Willis. I'll use Bruce Willis as an example. Let's say he wasn't retiring, still working, right? So it's like, okay, cool. So you go to Bruce Willis, you go to the agent and you say, hey, I got a cool movie. It's a great script called Seven. It's like this detective story. It's really wonderful. I want to play the older detective. Bruce's people are like, okay, great. You need to pay him $5 million and he'll work for three days. You're going to get him for three days for five mil or whatever it is, somewhere around there. And you're like, what? I can't. He's, this is, this is the lead role, one of the lead roles in the movie. I need him for more than three days. And the agents are like, well, tough shit. You know, you want Bruce or not? Like, this is what he charges. Because remember, Bruce is used to getting $20 million a movie for however many days. So now they're like, you know, for Bruce to hey Bruce, you're going to get three mil for run of show. Bruce, like, fuck you. Like, oh, but it's only three days of work. You know, and that's, you know, we'll get into the actors in a minute because I think they're lar- in large part to blame for this terrible predicament that the film business is in at the moment. Um, but for whatever reason, Bruce and all the actors like him are saying, yeah, cool. We'll come out, pay us a million a day. We'll be the stars of these movies. And, you know, you got to, the filmmaker, figure out how to do this. Shoot me out in three days. Cause I'm not giving you more than that. Or even a week, which is egregious, whatever it is to be run of, to be the lead in a film. Um, and, and so, you know, the person financing the movie, they don't care either. They're like, look, this is the movie you want to make. Okay, cool. Um, we're going to give you the money, but we're pre-selling it, which means someone else has agreed to pay us once we deliver them a movie with Bruce Willis in 80% of the movie with guns being shot 40% of the time or 30% of the time, or whatever the rule is. And that's all they care about. And it's on this contract and it's all bonded up and uh, now they're lending against it. But in order to get that money, they have to deliver the finished film within a set amount of time. And they don't care about anything else. And by the way, I don't fault them for that entirely. A little bit, yes, because they could push themselves. But for the most part, look, it's capitalism. They're trying to make a buck. That's okay. But I do fault the actors because they're artists and they should care more, right? And there's no reason that one of these actors making three to $4 million dollars to come out and be in this film, can't just say, look, this is the state of the market. This is where we are today. This is where movies are. But I'm going to pick my roles wisely. I'm going to work with filmmakers that are cool. I'm going to take a moment to just look at the work, read the screenplay, make some good decisions myself. And then if I like it and like them, I'll work with them. And I'm going to give them the time that they need within reason. You don't have to be egregious about that either because filmmakers will get as much as they can get. But just go, hey, if I'm going to lead the movie, I'm not going to force you to shoot me out in three days. Like, let's make a fucking movie. You know, like, don't you enjoy making movies? Isn't that, isn't it still fun? I mean, it can be. There's no reason it can't be fun. So long as you're not coming into the movie, you know, it's not fun. It's not fun when a filmmaker has to shoot their movie in 14 days, which is impossible. 10 pages a day, right? You're, you're running like a chicken with your head off 
You're not getting cool coverage. You're not taking the time to find the scenes. You're just shooting. This is why a lot of these movies, if you look at them, it's just this camera, this angle here, medium lenses, just that coverage, that coverage, this cut to here, cut to there, right? There's no, there's no play in the cinema. They're not looking overhead and here and catching angles and composing and blocking shots. They're doing none of it because they don't have the fucking time. They got to shoot this fucking, they got to shoot Bruce in three days, you know? So it's like, they're getting in there like, all right, Bruce, this is, this is where you're on the phone with the, the hostage and you're telling him to keep calm, but you got the gun on the bad guy, <laughs> whatever shit. And these movies suck and there's no reason for it. And actors, I blame the fucking actors. They should care more because if they cared more, and if they made good films, good crime films, good thrillers, good action movies, people would come back to the movies. People would watch them. That's the way it goes. We've seen that with A24. Build it and they will come, right? There's no reason more of these producers making these films can't just push themselves a little bit, but they're, they're too short-sighted. Everyone's a little too short-sighted at the moment. And it's sad. I don't know why that happened. Um, I mean, I get it the salaries shrink, right? That did happen. Things got compressed mainly because pirating has definitely eaten into the business. No question. And then coming out of the pirating era and the loss of the DVD and that whole revenue stream, right? The home entertainment market is not what it used to be. You have these streaming services that were born in, in, in the wake of that and said, Hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to charge you the cost of what you would pay for just one movie. We're going to charge you that once a month. So like you're watching one movie a month, but you get all, you get to watch all of our movies whenever you want. And we'll always make new ones for you. Don't worry. Right? And so they do that. And then they start getting subscribers on. People are paying them. But yet they still have to spend more than what they're making from their subscribers. So what do they do? Well, they raise money from investors, from VC. And they say, we're a tech company. This is what we're doing. This is going to grow. And then eventually we'll be able to monetize it in really wonderful ways and beat the market and create a moat. You guys like moats, right? And then they do that. And then they get all this VC money and the VCs are like, they put all their money and they're like, well, the way we're going to get out is we have to go to the public markets, right? So now the tech company goes to the public market, it goes public. And then the public people rush in, they do all this fanfare. MSNBC talks about it, what a great investment it is. And all the retail people go, oh, this is a great investment. And they rush in, they buy and the stock price goes up. And then the company borrows debt, tons of debt against all of the subscribers, the stock, et cetera. They go to the debt markets. They're able to raise this debt and put out guarantees and say, hey, we're going to raise all this extra money. So now it's debt funding. And now they're just spending like crazy to make these movies. They're paying you know, a few directors 10 times more than they would ever make or ever get to make their movies just because they're desperate to get something good. And then like, you know, trying to feel tons of other movies, but they don't really have a hand in any of them. So you get all these companies out there getting these commissions that are just trying to churn them out to throw product in there. And of course the art form of running a studio has kind of been lost to them as well. Because if you go back and study cinema history, the great Titans of the studios, they really knew what they were doing. And there's an art to producing. There's an art to managing a studio, managing creative people, fostering a good script, knowing when to take the right chances knowing when not to take the right chances, um, you know, bringing in good talent and encouraging them and giving them multiple shots and building careers, right? And that's what led to some of the great producers throughout history who have just tons of, not only just hits for the time under their belt, but classic movies. You look back at some of these mega studios and they really just got classic after classic after classic. You look at some of these periods of time, but wow, they were just churning out absolutely incredible work back to back to back. A few misses here and there, of course, but like just really original stuff. That is an art to run, to produce at that level. You know, that's why the producer gets the Academy Award traditionally. Okay. That's the person who is supposed to get the Academy Award for best picture. They have best director, best screenplay, best actor, best sound, best everything. There's no best producer. There's best picture. And it goes to the producer because originally it was one producer who would take a film all the way. And they usually had a deal at a studio with a studio head. And they would trust these producers to like, really, this art form is very much so dying, okay? Now you look at a movie, there's like 80 producers because they're just kind of getting money in together or getting your Bruce for three days, right? 
Um, it's a whole other conversation of what's happened to the producer, um, why it's died out, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, these tech companies have come in, they've debt financed the hell out of their product and or they're subsidizing it with their prime membership or with their iPhone, right? And all of this capital, they're just push it into the market. And they do very much so like what Uber did to the taxi business, right? It's like, hey, we're going to subsidize your Uber rides for a long time with our VC money and then our, uh, you know, from private markets and then from public markets and then from debt markets. And then we're going to kill taxis. We're going to push out the little guy. We'll get all the legislation we need. We'll get eyes and ears, hearts and minds. We'll get on your phone. We'll get it sticky. We'll get you used to this. And then we'll slowly raise prices and we'll slowly become profitable over this longer period of time. But in the meanwhile, the stock price is going to go up. We can borrow against it and do all kinds of crazy things and spend, 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 spend. Let's not worry about it right now. Well, it's been the same model with film. And what does that do to a market, right? Well, it does the same thing. The little mom and pop taxi driver, they get run out. They cannot compete, right? Prices become inflated. It becomes artificial. It becomes an artificial market. Suddenly crews and certain people are getting expected to pay the, you know, different expectations and that goes up and then it becomes harder for smaller films to even find these crews. And then the unions start coming in, establishing a whole new set of rules and just raising the bar there and making it even harder for little mom and pop, right? So they flood a marketplace and distort it. It really does distort a marketplace when you're just debt finance to that degree. Now, of course, we're seeing issues with the model, the subscription model. Um, I mean, it's probably working out just fine for Apple and Amazon because they have a revenue generator in a different direction, right? Like that's just an extra piece of their bundle. But with Netflix, we've seen their stock price drop significantly. And now they're adding ads. And now they're also cracking down on people sharing their stuff. And that's going to continue because they have to find ways to become more profitable. This will also affect their movies. It's to be very interesting to see what their movie making becomes like under these constraints. I mean, look, they already have a hard time not putting them down by any means. I like a lot of the movies that they make, but I do think for the amount of money that they spend and the amount of films that they make, a lot of them, I mean, come on, you just look through most of Netflix's stuff and you're like, I don't, you know, most of it just, they make a banger once in a while, right? But I mean, you know, if you're throwing spaghetti against every fucking wall in your house, one thing better stick once in a while, you know, and that's, I don't know that that's a model for longevity, but we will see. Um, so nonetheless, actors, legends, those who get movies financed, if you're going to do something, don't force your filmmaker into an egregious situation that is you, you're failing before you even start. Don't even do it. Why do it? You're not helping the movies. You're not helping the, bi the business, the industry. You're not helping culture. You're helping yourself at that point. And didn't you get into this to make great films?